Good afternoon everybody and welcome to this webinar. Uh, my name is Lee Martin and I'm the manager of the Intraacoustics Academy and I'm very pleased to say that today uh, we have Dr Eric Schneider who will be presenting our webinar on the topic of gain calculation methods in the video head impulse test. Um, just a couple of admin things to note before we begin. Uh, all of you have been muted uh, on your microphones. Uh, if you have any uh, anything that you want to say to us or any questions, then please type them into the instant message box, uh, which you can find on the left-hand side of your screen, and we'll answer any questions which we find in there at the end. Uh, if you have any technical problems, please also share those in the instant messaging box, and uh, Hella should be able to help if there's any problems. Okay, so let's continue with today's webinar. And as I mentioned, uh, today uh, we'll be having Dr. Eric Schneider present for us. Uh, Dr. Schneider is a professor for medical informatics at the Brandenburg University of Technology in Germany. But in addition to that, he also developed the ICCAM whilst he is a senior research scientist uh, of the Department of Neurology um, at Munich University Hospital. Uh, he co-founded the company IC Tech in 2013 and subsequently marketed IC Cam at Interacoustics. Uh, so I'm very happy to hand over to Dr. Schneider and he will begin today's webinar. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Lee. Hello, this is um, Eric Schneider. I would like to start the, the, the webinar with uh, presenting you first the, the learning outcomes of this, of this webinar. Um, I would like to to understand the differences between gain calculation methods and VE testing. So that's that's the first aim of the seminar. Um, and then I would like uh, you to know how to avoid pitfalls in um, video head impulse testing. And finally, uh, I would like to teach you how to improve the data quality in video head impulse testing. So these are the aims for the seminar. Now, as the first step um, I want to start with the gain, calculate, gain calculation methods in the gold standard search coil. So uh, these are on the left you can see two images uh, of the search coil. So first the first image on top is um, the coil just before it is inserted into the eye. So it's a very small and lightweight device. And on the bottom in the bottom image you can see how uh, the coil looks like when it is attached or when it when it is attached to to the sclera. Um, the search coil has certain advantages, and that's why it is uh, why it still is the the gold standard in ocular motor research. It's a very lightweight device. It uh, weighs less than one gram. Uh, it has a very high temporal resolution. Uh, more than one kilohertz. I've seen labs using it at five kilohertz, and it's a very accurate and precise uh, device. And finally, uh, which may, makes it very attractive for head impulse testing, is that it has only minimal slippage, if at all. Although I've seen a paper recently which has shown that there is quite some slippage in the torsional plane, but that's not so important now for, for uh, head impulse testing. Um, it has the advantages uh, which, which I have named, but it also has some disadvantages, which makes it um, very unfeasible in a, uh, to use it in a clinical setting. Uh, the, the biggest disadvantage is that it is, it is considered invasive. Uh, so uh, the uh, measurement time is limited to less than 30 minutes, um, and usually you want to measure eye movements for uh, a longer period of time. If we're talking about, for example, the uh, caloric test, this usually takes longer than 30 minutes. And it also affects saccade dynamics. Uh, so these are the reasons why it's still, um, it's, it's still the gold standard in eye movement research, but it's not, it has never entered clinical, real clinical applications. The search call, it has been used uh, for the first time in um, in uh, 1990 to quantify vestibular function with a head impulse test. Uh, the main outcome measure was instantaneous gain, which is shown in this image as a um, function of time. P 
Please note that the analysis in this first in these first papers. Uh, the analysis of, of the gain uh, was restricted to 100 milliseconds uh, in order to avoid extra vestibular sources. In addition, um, I and head velocity traces have also been plotted as a function of time, as you can see here. So these are the I and head velocity traces, uh, which give you uh, or which present the instantaneous velocity over time. The, in these papers, the authors also stress the importance of moving the head quickly, rapidly, uh, and that's why it actually it's called the head impulse test. So the, the movement has to be impulsive because only rapid, unlike slow head movements, do demonstrate uh, VOR asymmetry. In another analysis, which you can see here, uh, the eye velocity was also plotted as a function of head velocity. So here uh, on the y-axis, i velocity, x-axis, head velocity. And the one is plotted as the function of the other. I will tell you some details about this analysis later. So during, uh, the, uh, during the, uh, the development of the Interacoustics ICAM V8 system, we focused on adopting as much as possible the gold standard methods that were introduced with the search call before. In particular, we restricted all analysis to a similar time span of less than 100 milliseconds uh, in order to avoid extra vestibular signals. And on the next slides, I will walk you step by step through the individual methods which we've uh, implemented. First, we're plotting the eye and head velocity traces as a function of time in a similar way as in the search call data analysis, as you can see here. So this is uh, search call data from 1996. And these are our I and head velocity, tr velocity traces as we are plotting them in the ICCAM V8 system. One important aspect of this is that we try to enlarge the traces as much as the space on the report allows. Um, so you get kind of a zoomed in version of these uh, of these velocity traces and this zoomed in presentation helps to more easily identify artifacts such as noise or slippage should such artifacts be present uh, with a smaller presentation of eye and head velocity traces there is a tendency to rather hide the artifacts which we want to avoid in our way to present the data. This links to the, uh, to the final section of the webinar in which I would like to talk about how to improve data quality in VHIT. So please remember these uh, eye and head velocity tra traces and the reason why we are representing them in an enlarged version. This slide shows you that there are different ways how to present eye and head velocity traces. One can plot the eye velocity as a mirrored version of the head velocity, as you can see here. So here is the eye velocity, here is the head velocity, and the one is a mirrored version of the other. Uh, but the user also has the option to plot the head and eye velocity traces such that they all show in the same direction, as you can see here. So all velocity traces show uh, into the positive direction. This way of uh, presenting the data might be helpful in identifying a vestibular hyperfunction, as you can see here at a glance. Um, the difference between the, the blue head velocity trace and the black eye velocity trace can immediately see, be seen in this presentation. And with a menu, if you're using the uh, uh, view, mirrored, enable or disable menu, you can switch between these two ways to uh, present the eye and head velocity traces. The next and uh, most important method which we've adopted from the gold standard search call is the instantaneous gain. For every time step or every sample, we're calculating the ratio of eye to head velocity and we are plotting the result as a function of time. So we're taking the eye velocity from here and we are dividing that by the head velocity at, a, at an instantaneous time point, and we're plotting the result 
here at the bottom. And we're doing that for each and every sample um, along the recording up to 100 milliseconds. And this results in, in, this, in, in these traces here. Um, and unity gain in a normal subject results in traces that are aligned along their whole length around the gain value of 1. And this is, if you compare that with the search call re recording, you can see that this is uh, comparable. With this instantaneous gain as a function of time, one has the choice of which value to report. You could take a value at, let's say, 10 milliseconds or 20 or, let's say, 55 and so on. Um, we, or we could have used uh, the value uh, at, at the peak acceleration, which is about here, or the value around peak velocity, which is around here. Um, but this poses some problems. Uh, if, if we use the, the values at the peak acceleration or the, value, the values at, at, at peak velocities, that poses some problems which are um, examiner uh, dependent. So they would depend on examiner technique. Um, with different techniques, these peaks could occur at different points in time. So you never know exactly uh, which, which gain you're then reporting or the gain at which point in time you're reporting. And that's why we're using predefined time points at exactly 40, 60 and 80 milliseconds in order to sample the gains. Um, in doing so, we adopted the method of another search call based study which you can see here on the right. This search call uh, study is from our lab in Munich. Uh, and in this study, gains at 20, 40, 60, 80, and even 100 milliseconds have been used. But we reduced the, the main outcome measure in ISICAM to just one gain value at 60 milliseconds. On a later slide, I will provide a rationale for this decision why we use 60 milliseconds and not another value. Although we're suggesting to use the instantaneous gain at 60 milliseconds, we also report two more gains at 40 and 80 milliseconds. So here again at 40 and again at 80 milliseconds. Um, because there is some evidence in the literature that different pathologies might lead to different gain time courses, which means different gains at different time points. This can be seen here in images from a paper by uh, Kramida and colleagues. Uh, in one pathology, the gain remains rather constant over time here uh, in, in, the, in the black, uh, in the black uh, box and whisker plots. And in another pathology, the gain is decreasing over time, as you can see in the gain uh, in, in, the gray, uh, in the gray values. And you can also see that in the, in the gain traces here, so this is one pathology, and this is the other pathology. So here you can see that the gain is rather constant over time in search call data. And here the gain decreases over time. And that's the reason, that's the main reason why we don't just report one value at 60 milliseconds, but uh, three values, which would also then reflect, for example, a decreasing um, uh, gain value over time. This might uh, show useful in future analysis, but for the moment, uh, we think that the gain at 60 milliseconds provides a good outcome measure um, for assessing vestibular function. Uh, we also adopted the presentation of eye velocity as a function of head velocity. We're using this data presentation to calculate and display the regression slope as another measure of VOR gain. So here, you get a slope value for the left side and a slope value for, for the right side. Um, and please also note that we are restricting this analysis uh, to eye and head velocity data pairs to a maximum time of 100 milliseconds, again, in order to exclude extra vestibular signals. Uh, in view of the later webinar section on different gain calculation methods, uh, the formula uh, for calculating the regression slope is important, and I'm displaying this formula here. So what you can see in this formula is that the slope is calculated by summing over I velocity values and multiplying each and every I velocity value with the, with the corresponding head velocity value. So that gives you one sum. And then there is another sum on the bottom 
um, so it's the numerator sum, uh, and here you add the multiplications or the, the squares of the head velocity value. So you take each and every uh, each and every head velocity value, square that, and sum all those values together up. Well, starting at at the time point of zero and up to a value of 100 milliseconds. And if you divide the two sums, you will uh, get a slope value. And for a normal subject without a vestibular loss, the slope will be around one, a value of one. So that's that's the uh, um, that's the regression analysis, which we also do in addition to the instantaneous gain analysis. So just like with a gold standard search call, the presentation of I velocity as a function of head velocity allows to assess vestibular function at a glance. One can easily identify a vestibular asymmetry both in a search call recordings and in VHIT by simply looking at these plots. So here's an, uh, here's an asymmetry with uh, search call recordings reported in 1990 by uh, Dr. Halmagis group. And here you can see a similar picture um, with, a, with a VR uh, gain asymmetry uh, shown in, in these regression plots. This asymmetry is also numerically reflected uh, in the two different slopes and in the slope calculations. I've shown you the formula before how to calculate a slope. So here's one slope which is close to one and another slope which is close to a value of 0.6. So it's uh, reflected in, in these different slopes numerically, and it's also reflected in the, um, in the gain asymmetry index, which in this case is uh, 26%. And, the, uh, and this value is calculated from this value and this value. So in the next section, uh, I would like to talk about the differences between gain calculation methods in video head impulse testing. So this is a more complex slide and I, I will try to walk you through it step by step. In order to demonstrate the usefulness of instantaneous gain, I would like to start with a computer simulation of a normal instantaneous gain of a virtual and healthy subject with a normal gain. So the plot here on, on the top left, it shows overlaid eye and head velocity traces in a similar way as you've seen before. Uh, since this simulates an ideal case, the head velocity trace is hidden by the black eye velocity trace. So there's a green, there's a green uh, head velocity trace in the, in the background, and in front there's a black um, eye velocity trace. The dots which you can see here, so the, the individual dots, they represent the individual samples which are recorded at equidistant points in time. For our sampling rate of 220 hertz, the, the distance between these uh, time samples is about 4.5 milliseconds. There also is a trace for slippage, so it's this one here, so it's the gray slippage trace. Um, which in this case, however, remains at zero, um, as this is an ideal case without any slippage at all. So slippage is zero. At the bottom, we see this simulation of the instantaneous gain as a function of time, which assumes a value of 1.0 for the whole duration of the simulation. So here it starts, it starts at around zero and it remains at a value of 1.0 because I'm always dividing one value by the same value. So if I have, for example, a value of, let's say, uh, 200 degrees per second for I velocity, I also have a value of about 200, of, of exactly 200 degrees per second for head velocity. And if I divide 200 by 200, the result will be one. And this number will be uh, plotted here in this diagram. And the same holds for um, uh, a velocity of 100 degrees per second. So 100 divided by 100 will also give you a value of one. And if you compare that to the search call data, uh, from, from the paper which I've mentioned before, you can see that the simulation is quite comparable to what we can see in the search call data. So in the search call data, in a normal subject, we also have gain traces which are very close to unity gain, which are very close to a horizontal line 
at, uh, at a value of 1.0. What you can also see here is a vertical line, uh, a vertical dotted line, which represents the instantaneous uh, values of the velocities of i and head velocities and the instantaneous values of the of the gain at exactly 60 milliseconds and if you compare that uh, if you compare that with with these uh, with the with the earlier search call data you can see that the value that the 60 millisecond gain is extracted from here the next slide shows what happens with a uh, VR hyperfunction. Just like in the slide before, the head velocity is represented by the green trace. The slower eye velocity trace is represented by the black dots. Now, since the, uh, since the eye velocity trace is slower, it doesn't hide anymore the head velocity trace, which can now be clearly seen. It's not anymore hidden in the background. So let me switch back and forth between the two slides. So here again, a normal gain, a hyperfunctional VR gain here. And you can probably see the difference between the two traces when I'm switching back and forth. So um, instantaneous gain here at the bottom contains the most important information. In comparison to the normal trace before, let me switch back. So this is the normal trace. This is the, the hyperfunctional VR. In comparison to the normal trace before, it assumes constant values at 0.8. And the gain, the instantaneous gain at 60 milliseconds, uh, represented here by, by the vertical dotted line. Uh, this, of course, will also have a value of 0.8, as you can see here. And here you have the, uh, the formula for how the gain at 60 milliseconds is calculated. So you get the I velocity at 60 milliseconds and you divide it by the, the head velocity at 60 milliseconds. In this case, uh, this will give a gain at 0.8. On the right, uh, you can see real uh, video head impulse data um, and you can compare uh, the velocity traces from the simulation with the velocity traces from the real data. You can see the difference between the head velocity um, here and the, uh, and the I velocity. So the I velocity is much slower than the head velocity. You can immediately see that there is a, a gain deficit in, in this subject or in this rather patient, in this patient here. And also uh, there's a, a good, uh, you can compare the, um, the instantaneous gain uh, the simulated instantaneous gain with the recorded gain here. And here you can also see that the values starting at around 40 milliseconds and a little later, the values assume um, a, a constant line, which is at about 0.5, a gain of 0.53 or so. So this slide provides the rationale for why we're suggesting to use the instantaneous gain at 60 milliseconds. So here in black, there is the gain at 60 milliseconds in, uh, in the normal recording, which I've shown before. And here is a, um, here's a patient with a vestibular hyperfunction on the right side. And here we again have the gain at 60 milliseconds. Uh, in a normal subject, uh, it would make no difference uh, whether we use the gain, for example, at 40 milliseconds or at 80 milliseconds if you use search call data. But uh, VHEAT recordings are different from search call recordings, mainly because they are done with a camera instead of the, the lightweight search call. And the camera is much heavier and therefore uh, we see the effects of the camera inertia mainly at the initiation of the movement. So here we have the movement initiation and there's a clear difference between search call data and VHIT data. So that's the effect of camera inertia here, uh, starting at zero and up to about uh, 40 milliseconds or 40 to 50 milliseconds, there will be an effect of this camera inertia. So that's one, um, uh, one artifact which, which can affect gain calculation. 
And on the right, we see another effect which might affect uh, which might affect gain calculation. And the, this effect comes from so-called early covert saccades. Now, if we would calculate the gain at 80 milliseconds here in this in this patient, the covert saccades would affect gain calculation strongly. So here we suddenly have a gain of 1.12. Uh, this is not a real number. It's a false misclassification of a supranormal gain due to uh, these very early saccades. And what you can see here is that the gain at 60 milliseconds is least affected uh, by inertia artifacts or camera inertia artifacts and by early saccades. And that's that's the main reason why we suggest to use this gain at, at 60 milliseconds. I've been talking about uh, slippage and this uh, video here shows you a simulation um, of the slippage effect. So what happens when the camera slips? Now on the left you can see you can see a rotating eye. So here only the eye rotates and that's exactly what, what we uh, what we want to see in, in a, a V-hit system. So the eye rotates and I want to measure the rotation of the eye movement. The camera doesn't move. Now, the camera can move in uh, around two different uh, degrees of freedom. So one movement can be a translation, uh, so a translation of the camera on the head, and the other movement can be a rotation of the camera. Now what happens if the camera translates by a very small amount of two millimeters? And we try to, uh, to create this, this simulation as realistically as possible. So here, the camera translation of two millimeter will uh, lead to um, a, a moving pupil in the image, which is comparable to the, uh, to the previous rotation of about uh, plus minus 10 degrees. So, a translation of two millimeter corresponds to a false, falsely detected rotation of 10 degrees. Now the camera can also rotate, as I've as I've uh, mentioned. So here you, you see a rotating camera. If you closely look to look at the image, uh, you can see that this camera rotates. And again, the image in the camera, so that the pupil position in the camera image will translate from left to right just as if only the eye would rotate. So both effects can be present, uh, can be present um, while uh, the head is impulsively moved. And this camera movement is ampli amplified by the camera geometry, by the optical setup of the camera, and in such a way uh, that, you, uh, that these uh, camera movements are misdetected, are falsely misdetected as um, eye movements. Now, if camera movement affects um, affects data traces, the effects can be uh, similar to what what you can see here. Um, and in this slide, I'm showing you a uh, biphasic slippage effect, which would result from a camera oscillation. So here's the biphasic slippage effect. Uh, so the camera would oscillate in one direction, then it would oscillate back into the other direction. And you can also see the effect uh, of this camera oscillation in the, um, in the gray areas which, uh, which, represent, uh, which represent the difference between eye and head velocity traces. You probably know that position gain has been introduced into uh, v an analysis as a means to uh, to overcome this slippage problem. And with the formula here at the bottom, I, I'm going to try to explain how this, uh, how this uh, effect can be averaged out. So uh, you're taking the area under the I velocity curve, which is given here. So the formula for the area under the I velocity curve is here. And this is the formula for the area under the under the head velocity curve, and they're very similar. And the only difference is that here we have eye velocity um, samples or eye velocity values, and here we have head velocity values. The rest is the same. So now we start at the uh, at the time value of zero. So we take the eye velocity at zero um, and multiply that 
with the delta t, which is the, the time difference between two samples. So that's the first step. And then we move on to the next sample and do exactly the same for the next sample, uh, which, which is shown here, until uh, about 150 milliseconds, which is around here for this movement. For other movements, for slower movements, it can be even uh, late, at a later point in time, for example, 200 milliseconds. Uh, and we again multiply the I velocity with the delta T. And we do exactly the same for uh, for head velocity. So we get a sum here in the, the numerator and a sum here in the numerator. Two sums, we divide the two sums and that's, um, and that's position gain. Now, if we rewrite the, the, uh, the two formulas, so what we do here, we sum up the uh, I velocity values from T equals zero to T equals 150 and multiply each and every sample with a delta t. And we do the, exactly the same at the bottom. Now, what you can see here is that we uh, can um, cancel down the delta t. So we cancel down the delta t in the numerator and, and in the, the numerator. And what we're left with is the sum over all i velocity samples divided by the sum over all head velocity samples, which is nothing else than the formula for the mean value or the average, right? So we simply get two averages. We get uh, an average over time of the of the I velocities and an average over time of all the head velocities. So in fact, what we are doing is we are taking all these samples, we're calculating an average uh, value for each and every curve, and we are dividing the two averages. Now, what happens with this biphasic oscillation here is that the, its effects will cancel out. So the, effect, the effects here will be negative, these effects here will be positive, and the, the negative effects will cancel out the positive effects. So in the end, um, the effect of slippage will be cancelled out in, the, in this ideal uh, simulation or under, under this ideal condition. Um, now, this is the, the same situation as before, just th that we don't have any slippage. Uh, so the slippage is at zero. So here, nothing will be canceled out, uh, simply because the, 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 slippage, uh, the slippage effect is zero. But um, due to the averaging, the gain dynamics will be lost. So that's one drawback. And another drawback is that we, uh, we get unwanted extra vestibular inputs into the calculation. So we, we will have values um, from, uh, from samples which are uh, sampled after 100 milliseconds, and those values will enter the gain calculation. Uh, so, for example, uh, smooth pursuit effects might, uh, might enter the gain calculation for the VR, which we don't really want to have in our calculation. Now, in the next step, I would like to show you some results under ideal conditions. So, again, uh, this, the, same, the same simulation as before. Uh, we have a normal VR gain um, uh, with a value of 1.0. We have the different, uh, we have the different uh, methods of how we calculate the gain. So first we have the instantaneous gain at 60 milliseconds. Uh, we have the position gain, which I've just explained, uh, which is uh, calculated as the average over time. And then we have the slope or uh, the, yeah, the regression slope, which I'm also showing here. And I want to uh, remind you of the formula for the slope. Uh, I've mentioned that the slope is calculated as the sum over I velocity times head velocity divided by uh, head velocity squared. And if you compare the two formulas, uh, so first the, the formula for, um, for, the, uh, for position gain, or as I would rather tend to call it, it's the average gain, if you compare that with the formula for the slope, you will see that they are quite similar. So here for calculating the slope, I, I'm also calculating a sum over time, not just for I velocity, but for I velocity weight or multiplied with head velocity. And then I'm dividing by the 
head velocity by the square head, head velocity. And this is uh, similar, but not exactly the same as, as the averaging here. So here I do not multiply with head velocity and I don't take the square of head velocity, but only head velocity. But uh, apart from that, they, the, the two formulas are very similar. There's one difference. If you take position gain from starting at zero um, up to where, uh, head, uh, where the head movement crosses zero again, this might be about 150 milliseconds. Uh, you will also get extra vestibular signals into the gain calculation, uh, into this averaging gain calculation. Uh, with the way we are implementing the slope calculation, you won't get those extra vestibular signals because we are restricting the averaging up to 100 milliseconds. Now, in this ideal uh, case, if you compare the results with, with each other, so we have the result uh, we have the result of the gain calculation at 60 milliseconds. We have the result of the I um, of, of the position gain calculation, uh, and we have the result of the slope calculation. You will see that these results are identical. So here we get a gain of one. Here again we get a, a VR gain of one, and here for the position gain we get a gain of one. So under ideal conditions, uh, the results of the different gain calculation methods are identical. And it's similar with a, uh, with a VOR hyperfunction uh, under ideal conditions, which means no artifacts, no slippage. So here we have in this simulation, uh, there, uh, I simulated a patient with a gain of 0.8. So I multiplied the, the head velocity trace with uh, a value of 0.8, and this gives the, the eye velocity trace. Uh, that's a simulation I've shown before. Now, if you take the three different gain calculation methods, so the position gain, uh, the slope, uh, the regression slope, and the instantaneous gain at 60 milliseconds, you can see that the values are identical. So without any slippage, uh, you will, uh, the, 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 the different methods will give you the same values if the, uh, the relationship between I and head velocity is linear. So if you get a line here, uh, you will get the same values in each and every method. Now, what happens if slippage comes into play? Uh, what happens with the different gain calculation methods? So what, what will be the results? So I'm showing again this, this, this uh, simulation, uh, which I've been uh, using before uh, when, when I was uh, explaining the, the biphasic slippage. Now, what you can see here is that slippage will have a huge effect on instantaneous gain calculation at 60 milliseconds. Right? So at 60 milliseconds, we have a gain of 0.82. And this is a normal subject. Right? So the only thing which affects the, the I velocity traces is slippage. Now the position gain is at 0.99, simply because it averages out the, uh, the negative uh, oscillation effect by the, uh, the positive oscillation effect. The formula for the average or position gain is quite similar to, to the regression slope gain. And in the regression slope gain, um, I get the same effect. Uh, since I'm calculating an average here in the sum, uh, I will also cancel out uh, I will also cancel out effects of slippage. And then what, what uh, the result uh, will give you a gain around 1.0. In this case, it's 1.01. The averaging is 0 0.99. Now, what happens if the, if the slippage is not biphasic? So if the one phase doesn't cancel out the other phase, uh, and this is what, what I'm showing in this simulation. So the position gain now is at 1.0. One zero, so it's it's a it shows you a supranormal gain simply because uh, because the, the the negative values will not cancel out the positive values and the oscillation which we see here is longer uh, takes a longer time than the head movement. 
So the, the, the oscillation to, to the one side will not cancel out the oscillation to the other side. So the effect, um, so the effect will be a gain misdetection. With the slope, with the regression slope, um, since I, I'm restricting the, uh, the calculation to up to 100 milliseconds, the regression slope is not so much affected by the huge uh, after oscillation here. So th what, what happens here, this occurs after 100 milliseconds, so it doesn't enter so much into the slope calculation. And then I'm getting a gain of about uh, 1.0 or 0 0.99, which uh, corresponds to, to the true gain of this simulated healthy subject. But the gain, the instantaneous gain is still affected, so it, it assumes a value of 0.8. Uh, and you can see here that the slippage this camera slippage will affect this gain calculation at 60 milliseconds. So um, the, the uh, conclusion here is that you will get different, uh, different effects of slippage depending on the char characteristics of the slippage. So if the slippage is biphasic, the effects might cancel out, might but don't necessarily need to cancel out. If, if it's far away from a biphasic oscillation, you will still get an effect of um, you will still get an effect of slippage on gain calculation. Now, in the last in the last uh, two sections, I would like to discuss uh, pitfalls, possible pitfalls in VE testing, and how to avoid them, and how especially how to improve data quality in uh, video ad impulse testing. So there's a nice paper by uh, Yorgos Mantokoudis. Um, who has shown different pitfalls or who has cat categorized different pitfalls in VHIT testing. And most of the pitfalls he, uh, he has shown, they're all um, or most of them are avoidable. So let me walk you step by step through the individual pitfalls and how to avoid them. So one of the pitfalls uh, can be a delay or a phase shift between the um, between the head movement and the eye movement. And if you see a tracing like this, uh, it is probably uh, due to a loose strap. So if the strap of the goggles uh, is loose, uh, you might get this phase shift between eye and head movement. Now, what you can do there is to tighten the strap. So that's that's a very simple solution. Take off the goggles again, tighten them, put on the goggles, and then you might see that this uh, phase shift um, has vanished. If you see an increased gain or a gain which is highly increased, so here again, this is eye velocity, uh, sorry, this is head velocity data, the red one, head velocity data, eye velocity data. If the eye velocity is significantly increased, this points to a wrong calibration. Now, if something like this happens, or if you see uh, such data, then there is a simple solution to it. Calibrate, uh, calibrate your patient or subject again. Then there is a series of, of pitfalls uh, with, which are shown here. So um, these here, this, these here are so-called pseudo saccade. So here you can see a pseudo saccade or a mini blink. Uh, it might affect the eye movement traces as shown here. If such a pseudo saccade or a blink occurs at a late stage, you don't have to care about it. But it can occur during the head movement. And should it occur during the head movement, it's uh, that's not um, that that's not a big issue. You can just continue the recording by adding another trial. And if the next trial is not affected, and if you add another trial and another trial, and they're all not affected by such many blinks, uh, the effect of mini of, of this mini blink will vanish in the whole recording. Um, there can be blinks, stronger blinks, so no mini blinks, but but greater blinks. Uh, which might show up like this. And the same holds for, for these artifacts. You can simply continue with the recording, add another trial, um, and then the, the effect of, of, uh, of a single uh, false recording will vanish in the total recording. 
then you can have something like two peaks. Uh, this happens, uh, for example, if you touch the goggles or if you touch the strap. It, um, in this case, try to reposition your hand uh, and continue the recording by adding another trial. The next trial, if it is better than, than this one, uh, then uh, you've solved the problem. You can continue with the recording and in the end, uh, this will have no more effect on, on the gain calculation. The subject can also be inattentive, and that's uh, that. That's what you might see as a result. Uh, you might get uh, you might get eye traces in the wrong direction, for example. In such a case, again, you can continue by adding another trial. You can instruct your subject to be more attentive. You can motivate him, uh, and then you will uh, lose these artifacts. Um, there can also be a pupil tracking loss, which can show up uh, as oscillations like these here. Um, there, try to add another trial, see whether this happens again. If it happens again, you can reposition, uh, reposition the goggles, for example, such that the pupil doesn't hit uh, the edge of the image. So these are all avoidable pitfalls, which, which can be solved very easily. Uh, another pitfall is a uh, head overshoot or a bounce, but since the since uh, the analysis in, in the ISDCAM system is restricted to 100 milliseconds, this will have no effect on, on the gain calculation. So if you see something like this, uh, it's not really necessary to, to um, uh, to find countermeasures for avoiding these counter oscillations. Now, another more uh, important pitfall is a slow head stimulation. Um, so here in this paper, you can see a patient um, with a deficit on, on, the, on, on the left side, which is not very prominent, which you can't see with slow head stimulation. So here in this example, the patient has been stimulated with uh, 200 degrees per second, and there this asymmetry cannot really be seen very well. But at higher, uh, at, at faster head velocities, this asymmetry is unmasked. And this is exactly why it is important to use uh, quick or impulsive head movement, because rapid unlike slow head movements, do demonstrate VR asymmetry. And, the, um, and this can be easily seen or best be seen in these um, regression plots. Here, the gain on the left side is uh, normal. So the, the, the function of eye velocity uh, to, to head velocity is linear. It's, it's close to the, the diagonal for all head velocities. And here, um, the, the eye velocities start to get slower only at about uh, 200 degrees per second. So below 200 degrees per second, you get a normal picture. And if you don't stimulate fast enough, you will not get this uh, saturation in uh, in eye velocity. So it is, it is important to uh, stimulate quickly in an impulsive way in order to demask such asymmetries. So that's again an avoidable pitfall. Um, if you see, um, if you see um, in, in, in a patient which, uh, which you suspect of a uh, of a vestibular asymmetry, if you don't see an effect at uh, slow stimulation speeds, just try to stimulate faster. So we've seen only four major pitfalls which explain technical uh, problems in video head impulse testing. So first, we have calibration problems, which can easily be circumvented or, or solved by uh, a new camera adjustment or a recalibration. Then we have noise, uh, which uh, can consist of blinks, pupil tracking loss. And in that case, you should repeat the trial. You can have a low stimulus, low head stimulus. And in, the, in that case, you have to move the head faster. And then uh, the most uh, tricky one, 
so these are the goggle movements relative to the head. Uh, one way to overcome that problem is to, to tighten the head strap. So finally, I want to uh, present you some methods on how you can uh, you can improve data quality in uh, video head impulse testing. So here again, I'm showing you the this uh, simulation of an ideal case. Um, we have the uh, we have a, a subject, a healthy subject with a gain of one, um, and we in in this case uh, we have a instantaneous gain trajectory, which, which is very similar to search call data. So the, the gain trajectory is um, a, a simple line aligned at um, a gain value of one. And that, that, is, that is the desired case in a normal subject. So the aim is to get data in normal subjects, which are very close to what we see here. And also uh, here in the in the real search call data, and this is a uh, another real recording from VHIT, uh, which is compared to the search call data. So here we have search call data. Uh, we have the velocity traces here. They look quite similar between here and here, and also the the gain trajectory uh, is very similar to what we can see in a search call recording. All the gain val values are nicely aligned at one. So this is an ideal recording in a, uh, in a normal subject. And that's our desired situation. So that's what we, uh, uh, what we want to have in the testing. And this is again the, uh, the simulation of slippage. Uh, you will get, so if you have slippage, uh, you will get an effect on the gain traces, uh, depending on how uh, depending on the characteristics of the slippage, in this case it's, a, it's this biphasic uh, slippage, you uh, will get a biphasic effect on the gain, on the instantaneous gain trace. And that's something we, we want to avoid. Now, one way to, if you see such slippage effects, one way uh, you can avoid uh, those effects is, for example, by uh, uh, by uh, increasing the size or artificially increasing the size uh, on the nose, you can you can uh, put a few uh, layers of band eight on onto the nose such that uh, the goggle doesn't move anymore. This uh, is a very nice way to uh, prevent the goggle uh, from slipping. Um, and this method has been published uh, by the Vezina group in 2013. They have shown that by artificially increasing the nose, slippage effects are minimized. So that's one way to get around that problem. So what we've, what we've learned so far is that um, if you start with, with VE testing, you need feedback because you start with VE testing and you don't know how your data should look like. So uh, you need feedback. And if this feedback is provided from experienced neurotologists, um, then this can be um, this can be very useful in improving your data quality. The problem is if you if you buy a V8 system and if you don't have a neurotologist uh, whom you can ask, uh, what 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 can you do there? Um, and uh, in this case, so if you don't have an experienced neuro neurotologist around the corner, uh, you can use the feedback from the system. Uh, you can try to train to train yourself with normal subjects until you get results like this here. So until you get instantaneous gain traces, which are nicely aligned um, uh, along the unity gain, just as we're used to see uh, in, in search call recordings. If you start, you might not see a picture like this. You might indeed rather see um, something like this here. Right? And if you see something like this, then uh, try to train your or try to improve your technique until you see something like this in your instantaneous gain traces. Um, and this is just an example of a training session, of a very short training session, uh, which, uh, which we've done. So um, here we, we start with a less experienced uh, examiner. Um, 
these are head impulse traces uh, from from uh, from the first recording. Then uh, the examiner received uh, feedback from from an experienced examiner uh, on what to look at, uh, how to how to um, apply the forces uh, during uh, for for the head movement. And what we can see here is that there is a slight improvement um, from one session to the other uh, by receiving this this feedback. Now, uh, and, and you as a, uh, as a clinician might then use uh, these, um, these patterns here in the instantaneous gain traces uh, as, as, a, as a feedback. Uh, and this way uh, you can train yourself to obtain uh, ideal results like in this case here. So here again, uh, we have a, um, here in this case, it's a patient uh, on the with, with an asymmetry on the healthy side on the healthy side there is a nice alignment of the instantaneous gain with unity gain and similarly on the the affected side there's also a nice horizontal uh, line which which um, uh, demonstrates that the gain that the gain reduction is constant and you get values of about 0.5 at each and every point in time at 40 milliseconds, 60 and, and 80 milliseconds, the gain values are very similar. And also the gain value uh, of the slope, it's also quite similar to these gain values here. So in um, vertical uh, video head impulse testing, the, uh, the, the situation might be a bit different. Uh, there you sometimes get traces which are not nicely uh, aligned as uh, aligned around unity gain so in vertical head impulse testing the artifacts are more prominent and that's why in vertical head impulse testing we do not report instantaneous gain but instead we only report the uh, the regression gain which also cancels out part of the oscillations which we can see here in, in vertical testing. So and this is the, um, the IC6. Uh, so this is the final report of the, the head impulse testing. And here you can see that we are reporting both instantaneous gain and also uh, the regression slope for, for lateral canal testing. And for vertical canal testing, we're only reporting um, we're only reporting the, the regression slopes um, because there is more slippage in vertical canal testing. So in summary, um, the, the video head impulse test allows to reliably quantify the peripheral vestibular function even by beginners after a training period on normal subjects when the, the beginners receive feedback from expert neuroautologists and also when feedback from the system is used. So when beginners are using the instantaneous gain as a feedback to improve their technique, um, they will end up with reliably uh, with a reliable system with which they can reliably quantify the vestibular peripheral vestibular function. The instantaneous gain time course is important because it is sensitive to slippage and this can be used for training. It provides a useful feedback on technique quality in normal subject. And there are different gain calculation methods as we've learned. Each method has its own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, they yield, they all yield identical results under ideal conditions. So when there is no slippage, the gold standard instantaneous gain, in contrast to that, is sensitive to slippage, but slippage can be avoided by user experience. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, that was fantastic. Um, we have a question, I believe, on the side here. So Katie has asked, I understand that the IC cams can now measure median gain. Can you explain a little bit about this, please? Oh, yeah, sure. Um, I have a few slides on that. So um, in the ICCAM software version 1.2, we indeed additionally report a median gain. Um, 
similar to the regression slope, this median gain is calculated from the range from 0 to 100 milliseconds. So it's reported here, and we also display the range from which this median gain is calculated. Um, if you remember position gain, uh, which, which I'm showing here again, uh, if you rem remember that calculation, we've seen that this equals to the ratio of the average or the mean of I velocity divided by the average or the mean of the head velocity, shown here. So you have the two averages and you divide one average by the other. Now, instead of using the mean, one can also use the median, which is, at least for normal distributions, um, the results should be identical. So if you just replace here mean by median uh, and take the median of the eye velocity and the median of the head velocities, um, then you uh, get two numbers. Uh, and you divide the two and then you get the median gain value. And we restrict it to uh, we restrict the number of values which enter into this calculation up to 100, uh, 100 milliseconds. So the, uh, the mean is quite a useful number for uh, normal distributions. But if you look at an exemplary distribution of I velocities, which you can see here, um, the histogram demonstrates that there is no normal distribution. In fact, the distribution is skewed. So you don't have this peak in the center of, uh, of a normal distribution. You get the skewed distribution here, with a maximum around the peak slow phase I velocity. So here's the maximum of, of the histogram. And the, and the peak I velocity values, they go or they are stored into this maximum histogram bin. Now, in the presence of covert cards, the I velocity histogram shows a tail at high velocities. Right? So all these values here, all the saccade values, they enter this tail here. Without desegregation, so without, uh, without an algorithm that removes the saccades, these saccades can affect both instantaneous gain and the averaging calculation of position gain. In the presence of such a non-normal or skewed distribution, the median is often more useful than the mean. An additional benefit of it is that it automatically ignores outliers. So here are the outliers. It would ignore these outliers. Um, so cards can be outliers, but also artifacts, noise, and so on. Now, this automatic, this automatic um, desegregation or the, the automatic removal of cards from the calculation is shown in this exemplary slide here. The instantaneous gain at 80 milliseconds, as I've shown before, the instantaneous gain here is affected quite a lot by covert saccades. But the median gain calculation, if you have a look at the median gain calculation here, this median gain calculation um, is not affected. And, but, and even without explicitly removing these saccades from the traces, this gain is not affected. Similarly, the median would also ignore nystagmus uh, quick phases or nystagmus speeds and noise artifacts. In addition, it would immediately rate the effect of slippage, just like the position gain and the regression slope. However, it shares the drawback uh, with, these, with these gain calculation methods in that information about VR dynamics is lost. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Joachim has asked, uh, how will it affect the results of vertical impulses if head movement is more translational rather than rotational? Oh, um, hi, Joachim. <laughs> Um, so translational head movement is, of course, so there's more translational movement in vertical head impulse uh, testing than it is in horizontal head impulse testing. Translational movement will not have an effect on the on the angular VOR. So 
Um, but translational movement can have an effect on slippage. So it it will if there if if your if the camera is 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 not uh, tightly enough fixed to the head, then uh, you will get an effect uh, you will get an effect of slippage from from the translation. But it will not have an effect on the um, on the angular VR. So with an ideal system, it shouldn't have any effect. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, so Mike also asks a question. Um, he, he says, um, thanks, Eric, especially for your description of camera slippage. Regarding this issue, I'm wondering about measuring slippage directly. Is it not possible that if a camera were to follow both the pupil and another target that is not controlled by the VOR, such as the orbit of the eye, eyelashes or eyebrows, then one could differentiate between apparent eye movement due to slippage and real eye movement. Could one then also apply a correction for any slippage? Yeah, so this is actually this this uh, is the holy grail of, of eye tracking research. So um, actually, this you're, you thank thank you very much for for this for this uh, question, Michael. So it it points at the heart of of uh, all the problems we see, uh, not only in VE testing but also in in other eye tracking uh, research. Um, short answer. To your long question, um, then I have a longer answer to it. Short answer: No, it's it's unfortunately it's not possible. Um, we tried to do that. So we had a paper in uh, 2008 in which we we tried to do that. Um, we used as a reference for for measuring the slippage between uh, between the camera uh, and the head. Uh, we used the bite bar. Uh, and we measured the relative uh, the relative movement of the camera with respect to this bite bar. And by measuring the relative movement, we were able to compensate for the slippage. Uh, and and in, and we uh, we validated that with a search call. And we were able to reproduce uh, the search call data quite nicely in that attempt. But it's a bite bar. Um, it's uh, again similar to the search call. It's clinically not really useful. Now, in in the attempt to to uh, use other markers uh, on the skin, for example, uh, there is nothing around nothing around the eye which you can use as a marker is really stable. So if your goggle moves, your goggle will also move this this the skin surrounding the goggle. And if you have a marker on that skin, this this marker will simply move with the goggle. And um, you will not gain any additional information from that. Uh, it might even become worse, uh, actually. So um, until now, we really haven't found a real stable uh, marker which we could use for compensating or canceling out, out the slippage effect. A bite bar works quite well, but that's clinically not really useful. Um, so I have one last uh, uh, question, uh, and it relates to uh, using these um, gain values from a clinical perspective. And uh, if I'm new to video head impulse testing, uh, would I be right in thinking that uh, the way that a new clinician should um, approach it would be that once they've completed the video head impulse uh, test, is to look at the uh, the gain uh, trajectory of the uh, instantaneous gain and look to see if that's flat. If that's not flat and they're not able to perform any more additional head impulses, then is it then more reliable for them to look at the regression slopes as their main uh, value of gain? Or would you say that uh, the, the, the test is then invalid and needs to be repeated regardless? I'm talking about the training setting, right? So in the training setting, you need to work with uh, normal subjects. Um, and there, the aim is to have a flat, uh, a flat gain trajectory. So and if you, if you don't come to the point where the majority of your recordings are flat with a gain around one, uh, then you're doing something wrong. Right. So if in each and every of your test subjects, your normal test subjects, use family members or whoever, your colleagues, uh, never, please never start with patients. <laughs> right. So this is an error I often see. So people are uh, buying a system and the next day they are uh, having their patients 
um, and they will not be able to discriminate between patient data and normal data. So in the training, uh, during the training period, um, yes, use a normal subject. And if you, and, and the, the, the aim is really to have this flat, uh, this flat gain trajectory. If you have problems in, in, um, in getting those trajectories, then, then your, your uh, recordings are not valid. The uh, regression, the regression plots are, can be used in a similar way. Uh, so the regression plots, they shouldn't be flat, but they should be exactly at the diagonal, but they shouldn't depart too much from the diagonal. But it should again be a, a straight line, but a straight line aligned along the diagonal. If you get if you get S-shaped curves there, uh, then again you're doing something wrong. But if you're getting S-shaped curves in the uh, in the regression plots, uh, you will also get uh, you will also see the artifacts in the um, in the instantaneous gain plots. So they're they're similar in in this respect. Thank you very much. Okay, so I don't see any more questions being typed. So I'd like to uh, thank everybody for um, attending today. Um, if you do have uh, any further questions, uh, then please feel free uh, to send those questions to academy at introacoustics.com and we can then uh, forward those on uh, to Dr. Snyder who then will be able to uh, provide an answer or we at Introacoustics will be able to uh, try and find an answer. So, um, yes, thank you very much. And thank you again, Dr. Snyder, for today doing today's webinar. Yes, uh, thank you, Lee, for prepare, preparing everything. And uh, thank you for uh, your attendance. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much and goodbye.